What's up guys? In this video, we're going to be talking about how to prepare for and pass the clinical simulations exam. Are you ready? Let's go! If you're watching this video right now, then it most likely means that you've already passed the TMC exam. And if so, I just want to say congratulations because that is an amazing accomplishment and it means that you're one step closer to becoming a registered respiratory therapist. And before we get going, thank you so much for choosing Respiratory Therapy Zone, this YouTube channel, and our website as a way to help prepare for the clinical simulations exam. It is our number one goal to help you pass the exam on your very next attempt. And the stuff that you're going to learn in this video can set you on the right path to do just that. So if you're ready, let's go ahead and dive right in. So you're probably wondering, how can I pass the clinical simulations exam? Well, first and foremost, in order to pass the exam, it's going to take a lot of hard work and dedication from you. I know that's probably not what you want to hear, but there's no way around it. This is a mindset that you must adopt early on in the preparation process. And once you set your mind to the fact that you can pass the exam through hard work and dedication, it makes everything else a whole lot easier. And when preparing for the clinical sims, you are going to need a good, reliable CSE study guide. In order to learn the most important information, you need to get your hands on that information. And believe it or not, this is where many students mess up from the very beginning. And that is exactly why we created our own CSE study guide, because we were sick and tired of seeing students fail. I mean, I may be a little biased here, but in my opinion, our CSE study guide is without question the best resource on the market today. I mean, it's really not even close. <laughs> but we'll tell you more about it later on in this video. But for now, just know that it's crucial that you are studying the right information if you really want to increase your chances of passing the exam on your next attempt. So let's talk a little bit about the clinical simulations exam. As I'm sure you already know, the clinical sims has a much different structure than the TMC exam. Yes, it does share some of the same topical content as the TMC. The difference is, if you only master the topical content alone, you will not get a passing score because the CSE also tests your case management abilities. Our goal is to help you master both the content and the comprehensive abilities you need to pass the exam. Now let's talk about the clinical simulations exam rules. The test is fully computer based and you will have 4 hours to take the exam. There will be a total of 22 problems on the exam that are selected from 8 different categories. Two of the problems are pre-tested scenarios that are individually scored based on the judgment of the NBRC committee. Each problem represents a clinical setting or patient situation that is designed to simulate real life situations in the clinical practice of respiratory care. So before you head off to your testing center, just keep these rules in mind for the exam. You will not be able to bring a calculator to use for the exam. A pencil and a sheet of scratch paper will be provided for you no outside notes or books are allowed and you must return your scratch paper after completing the exam so you can't take it with you when you leave no personal belongings are allowed in the testing area so you must leave them in your car or vehicle you may leave the testing area at any time to stretch or use the restroom just keep in mind though that your test timer will not stop i mean if you gotta go you gotta go but just try to make it as quickly as possible because that timer is going to keep running. Definitely be on time. If you arrive more than 15 minutes late, you will not be admitted to take the exam. And upon arrival, you will need to show two forms of identification with at least one showing a current photograph. Both forms must be current and must include a signature. So definitely make sure you check your ID's expiration date before you head to the testing center because I would hate for you to get there and them not accept your ID because it has expired. What are the admission requirements for the clinical simulations exam? To be eligible to take the clinical sims, you must have obtained the CRT credential by successfully passing the TMC exam with the high cut score. This is just the basic qualification for most students, although there are others that can be found on the MBRC website. 
Another thing, be aware of the three year time limit. You must pass the clinical SIMS exam within three years after graduating from the respiratory therapy program. If you do not pass the exam within this time limit, you will be required to retake and repass the TMC exam with the high cut score to regain eligibility. Outside of the three year time limit, any previous passing performance to earn the RRT credential is nullified. So please be aware of this time limit. Now let's talk about pricing. How much does it cost to take the clinical simulations exam? The exam cost $200 for both new and repeat applicants. Now I don't know about you, but for me, $200 is a lot of money and I know that this is a significant investment for most people. So that is why it is our goal to help you pass the exam on your next attempt so that you only have to pay this fee one time. And that is another reason why it is so crucial for you to use a CSE study guide that can truly prepare you for the exam. It's so sad that I see so many students waste so much money taking this exam over and over again. But the good news is, if you put in the work by studying and preparing like you should, you can pass this exam on your first or next attempt and you'll only have to pay the fee one time. And our goal is to help you do just that. Now let's talk about content. What content will be on the Clinical Sims exam? As we've already discussed, a lot of the same content that was on the TMC exam will be on the Clinical Sims as well. They just ask it to you in a totally different way. But not to worry, we cover all of this inside of our CSC study guide. One thing to keep in mind is that a big focus of the clinical sims will be on pathology. You absolutely must know how to differentiate and treat the different diseases, and you must know what to recommend for these specific patients on a case-by-case -case basis. Seriously guys, cardiopulmonary pathology is the major focus of the clinical sims so you absolutely must know all the different diseases like it or not the MBRC put out a detailed content outline of exactly what to look for on the clinical sims exam you can find it on their website so I highly recommend you take a look over this outline so you'll have a better idea of what to expect to see on the exam now let's talk about structure how are the problems structured on the clinical sims exam this exam is designed to evaluate your patient management skills and ability to evaluate ongoing treatment recommend changes and adapt to circumstances and events so in order to accomplish this they have laid out the problem in a completely different way compared to the traditional multiple choice layout that we're all accustomed to so if you expected to see problems that look like the ones that were on the TMC exam, think again, because the structure of these problems are completely different. Here's an example of how the problems will be structured on the computer screen when you take the exam. As you can see, three windows will appear on the screen at all times during the exam. The first window at the top of the screen is the scenario this is just a brief paragraph that provides preliminary information about the patient. The following sections will contain information about the change in patient situation in this window as well. In the top right hand corner will be a picture of you. When you sit down to take the exam, the computer has a little web camera that will snap a quick photograph of yourself. Oh, when I took it, mine was so awkward, but that's beside the point. Back to the scenario window. Each scenario window will provide you with specific instructions about whether to choose only one response in this section or select as many responses as appropriate to gather information. It is super important that you follow these directions. Now in the second box or block is the options window. This one is displayed in the lower left portion of the screen. This window contains all options, choices, or possible responses that you can choose from. And you select an option by clicking the checkbox next to that option. And then in box number three, you have the simulation history window, and it's displayed in the lower right portion of the screen. This window shows the options chosen in the current section, and the results for each choice are displayed in this window. It also shows the simulation history from all the previous sections 
as well as the options chosen. So basically it helps you see the results that you've already selected in case you forgot. And when you are finished with this particular section, you can hit the go to next section button at the bottom left of the screen to continue to the next section. A box will pop up requesting that you confirm your wish to continue to the next section. Be sure to only click the yes button when you are 100% ready to proceed to the next section because you can't go back if you hit the button. And then one last thing, there's a timer button that is shown in the lower right portion of the screen and it displays the time that you have remaining for the exam. If it stresses you out watching the time tick away, you can hide the time remaining button if you wish simply by clicking on it. Now let's talk about scoring. As we said before, there will be a total of 22 problems on the exam that are selected from 8 different categories. Two of the problems are pre-tested scenarios that are individually scored based on the judgment of the MBRC committee. The total points scored on these will be added to your results at the end. Each student's version of the exam will be different, which means that each version will have a minimum passing score. And again, this is also decided by the testing committee for each exam. If your final score exceeds the minimum passing score, that means of course that you will have passed the exam. As I said, each exam is different, but on average, you will need to score roughly at least a 72% in order to pass the exam. That doesn't sound so bad, right? And just to give you a little exam hint, just know that more than half of the total points will come from the selections you make in the information gathering sections. That explains why it's a major focus throughout our CSE study guide. Now let's talk about the actual physical points that you can get for each selection you make on the exam. The scoring scale runs from negative 3 up to 3 points. That's right folks, you can earn up to 3 points or you can lose up to 3 points depending on the selections that you make. Usually there will be one best available answer that gives you the maximum amount of 3 points. This selection is necessary for proper care and not doing it would cause harm to the patient. Then you can get two points for selecting very important information that is good patient care. And this selection is not as important as the previous one that gives you three, but it's still pretty important. And then there's some selections that will only give you one point. This information is important and helpful, but it's not quite as crucial as the ones that give you two and three points. You get zero points for the selections that you make that are neither helpful nor harmful to the patient. Now here's where it gets a little bit dicey. This is where you lose points, and obviously we want to avoid this as much as possible. You will lose one point for selecting anything that is counterproductive. You will lose two points for making a selection that is very counterproductive. And this is the big one. You will lose three points for making a selection that is detrimental to the patient. This includes any selection that could result in harming the patient or worse. And like I said, obviously you want to make selections that earn you points and avoid those that take points away. Now let's talk about preparation. How to prepare for the clinical sims. We've already touched on this earlier, but now let's dive a little bit deeper. In order to increase your chances of passing the exam, you need to be prepared for the unique exam structure. As we said before, the clinical sims covers much of the same topical content as the TMC exam. They just ask it in a totally different way. You have to take what you know and apply it to a real life situation in order to make a decision to help the patient, just as if it were in a real hospital. And just to give you one little preparation hack that I always recommend, now that you have completed the TMC exam, you can take the results score report that they provide you at the end of your exam and use it as a guide to prioritize what you should focus on the most when you're preparing for the clinical sims. You can look over the score sheet and see is there a section that you didn't quite do so well on. If so, you may want to dedicate some extra time looking back over that section when preparing for the clinical sims. And by the way, 
We drop these little exam hints all throughout our study guide. These contain some of the most important tips, tricks, and insights that all students must know in order to pass the exam. That is one of the many perks of using our CSE study guide. Now let's go deeper into pathology. What diseases will be on the clinical sims exam? As we said before, knowing cardiopulmonary pathology is very important in regards to passing the exam and it is what you should spend most of your time on when preparing. Here are the eight disease categories that you should focus on when preparing for the exam. First, you have COPD, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. There will be a total of four cases in regards to COPD on the exam. And actually, to go even further, COPD is split up into two different subcategories. First, you have COP management. This is more concerning your long-term patients, for example, those with asthma, chronic bronchitis, emphysema, and bronchiectasis. Then you have COPD in critical care. These are those who are having an acute exacerbation of COPD, for example, those who need non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, and even those who need to be intubated and provided mechanical ventilation. Again, there are two cases from each of these subcategories of COPD for a total of four cases all concerning COPD. Then you have adult trauma. There will be a total of three cases concerning adult trauma. Some examples include head or chest injuries, pneumothorax, burns, drowning, smoke inhalation, and hypothermia. Then you'll have cardiovascular diseases. There will be a, a total number of three cases concerning cardiovascular disease. Some examples include CHF, pulmonary edema, heart attack, coronary artery disease, and valvular heart diseases. The next category is neuromuscular diseases. There will be a total of two cases concerning neuromuscular disease. Some examples include Guillain-Barre syndrome, myasthenia gravis, muscular dystrophy, stroke, and drug overdose. Next you have pediatric diseases. There will be two cases concerning pediatric diseases, and some examples include croup, epiglottitis, asthma, bronchiolitis, foreign body aspiration, toxic substance ingestion, and bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And then there's neonatal diseases. There are also two cases concerning neonatal diseases. Some examples include meconium aspiration, apnea, delivery room management, resuscitation, infant respiratory distress syndrome, and congenital heart defect. And last but not least, it's more of a broader general category that contains adult medical or surgical conditions. And just a few examples include head or neck surgery, thoracic surgery, carbon monoxide poisoning, and AIDS. For this video, I just wanted to kind of touch over all the eight disease categories and give a few examples, but just know that we cover each one of these in detail inside of our CSC study guide. So if you're interested and you want to learn more, there's a link down below in the description. But now let's go back to the components of a clinical simulation problem. There are three components to each problem that you will see on the exam. First, you have the scenario. This establishes the setting and general parameters of the patient and you, the respiratory therapist. Then, there's the information gathering. This section provides information about the patient that is normally obtained in chart review or diagnostic testing, such as vital signs, ABG results, etc. And then, number three, there's the decision making. This is the decision point that you will need to recommend what happens next for the patient. So after you're given the scenario, you will use the information gathering section to assess the patient and make an analysis and evaluation according to the information that is provided. Then in decision making, you must decide what type of therapy or response is best for the particular problem of the patient. But let's dive a little bit deeper and talk more about the structure of the clinical simulation problems. First, we'll talk more about the scenario. The scenario will describe the physical setting for the patient and you as the respiratory therapist. This could include the hospital or clinic type, the home, mid-surge unit, ICU, emergency room, time of day, etc. They will give you all of these details in the scenario. 
This is also where you will find out the general information about the patient, including their age, sex, general appearance, and general presenting conditions. You will also learn about the patient's history and a brief history of the patient's active illness or event. And the next section is information gathering. This is the section that you will be directed to in order to find out more about the patient. They will list out 15 to 20 parameters for you to choose from. For example, you will see vital signs, ABG results, PFTs, and various lab studies. You must select only those that are important for this patient at this particular time given what you know. Avoid selecting anything that could be dangerous for the patient. Also, of course, avoid selecting anything that you know is unnecessary for the patient at this time. Again, select only the desired information. Once you click an option to make a selection, it will reveal the results of what you clicked on the screen. For example, if you select that the patient needs an ABG, as soon as you click that option, it's going to show you the patient's ABG results on the screen. You can then act immediately if necessary. For example, if the patient's ABG results were to show that they are in respiratory failure with a super high CO2 and a very low pH, if this were the case, what would you do? Of course, you know the answer. You would want to recommend intubation and mechanical ventilation. And to give you an exam hint, this is important, so remember this. During the information gathering section, if you can already tell that the situation is a medical emergency, you should act right then to help the patient. If it's not an emergency, you can proceed to gather more information. Now let's talk about the order of progression when making your selections in the information gathering section. When your list of choices is available, there is a specific order that you should go through when making your selections, and I'm going to share that with you now. First and foremost, you're going to want to select the visual things first, meaning these are the things that you can see. For example, there's the patient's general appearance, appearance of the chest, respiratory rate, respiratory pattern, posture, and color. These are the things that you can literally see with your eyes. You want to choose all of these options first and then ask yourself, is there an emergency? If not, then you can move on to the next one. And these are your bedside choices. Now you can go through the list and select the choices that can be performed at the patient's bedside. These should all still be relatively easy to obtain. For example, these include the pulse, temperature, chest percussion, breath sounds, blood pressure, heart sounds, tracheal position, and capnography. These are the things that can literally be done or checked at the patient's bedside. And again, after you've gone through these bedside choices, you want to ask yourself, is there an emergency? And if there's not, then you can move on to the basic lab test. This is when you select the basic lab tests that are necessary for this patient. Some examples include an ABG, CBC, a 12 lead EKG, electrolytes, and or a chest x-ray. These are your basic tests that still aren't difficult to perform, but are only necessary if indicated for some patients. And again, after you select these basic lab tests, you have to ask yourself, is there an emergency? If the results of these tests do not show an emergency, then you can move along to selecting the special test. This is where you'll want to select any special tests that are indicated for this patient. These tests are very specific and should only be selected if it's necessary for this patient's case. Some examples include lab tests like a blood culture and you have PFTs, certain imaging studies like MRIs or CT scans, it could be a bronchoscopy, it could be that you need to check the patient's intracranial pressure, it could be hemodynamic monitoring, or there's special tests like a sweat chloride test for cystic fibrosis. It could be an APGAR score for a neonate, etc. These are the tests that are very specific for very specific patient situations. And after going through this progression and making all the necessary selections, you should interpret the data and make a proper decision in the next section. And that's where we're going to talk about the decision making. 
just to repeat myself because I really want to make sure that you understand this, after you have made all of your selections in the information gathering section, this is when you're taking to the decision making section. This is where you must take what you know from the information that you were given and make the best possible decision for the patient. Usually you will be asked to select the best of four to five options. Keep in mind, sometimes you will have to make the best available selection if the most desired option is not listed. Once you make the selection, it will usually say, physician agrees, done. However, it could possibly say, physician disagrees, make another selection. If it does, don't panic. It does not necessarily mean that you are wrong. It could possibly mean that you are wrong, but a lot of times they will do this just to try to see if you can pick the next best option. So when it says physician disagrees, you should proceed to pick the next best option using the information that you have available. And after you've made your decision, you will be taken to your next scenario. You must then evaluate how the patient responded to the decisions that you previously made. This pattern between information gathering and decision making usually cycles back and forth four to five times for each problem. You take what they give you, you gather the necessary information, and then you make the best decision possible for the patient. Boom, easy peasy. Sounds simple enough, right? Well, I hope that this breakdown made things a little bit easier for you. And guys, it's really not as bad as people make it out to be. You just have to take it one step at a time. And like I said, it's so important that you use the right information when you are studying for this exam. So there you have it. That wraps up this video on how to prepare for and pass the clinical simulations exam. I truly hope that this information was helpful for you. I know this video ran a little bit long and that's because there's just so much stuff that I want to share with you. But unfortunately, it's impossible for me to put it all in one video. This wasn't meant to teach you everything you need to know in order to pass the exam. However, this information definitely can set you on the right path to learning exactly what you need to know so that you can pass the exam and earn your RRT credential. If you enjoyed the information that was shared in this video, then you will definitely get even more out of our CSE study guide. We created it to specifically help students pass the clinical simulations exam on their first or on their very next attempt. We are very fortunate to get to help so many respiratory therapy students around the world and it brings me great joy that our study guide is already helping students pass the exam. So you gotta ask yourself, are you serious about passing the clinical simulations exam? And if so, then definitely check out our CSE study guide and you can find a link to it down below in the description. And that wraps up this video. Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end. I want to wish you the best of luck as you study and prepare for the clinical simulations exam. Keep working and studying hard and I know that you can do it. I believe in you, you just have to believe in yourself. Thanks again for watching and as always, Breathe easy, my friend.